What is up, Substance? Man, another rowdy First Wednesday crowd. I love it. I love it. Well, I'm, I'm excited that you are here today because, oh, if we haven't met, I'm Pastor Peter. And, uh, but I, I'm kind of extra excited about tonight because I want to talk about demonology. And uh, I, I want to ask the question, what really are demons? I want to ask, who is Satan? I want to I wanna talk about what does his flow chart look like? We talk about principalities and powers and spiritual warfare. And I, I want to actually explain some of that because I think that, you know, and, and along the way, I, I'm promising you I'm going to expose a few myths that maybe you've never heard before. Like, for example, a lot of people think that demons are fallen angels, and that's not entirely true. Uh, it, 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 there's an element of that. A lot of people think sa Satan is actually a demon when he's not. He's actually the prince of demons, but he's not actually a demon. And it's not entirely true either. I mean, he's demonic, but uh, there's actually a lot more to these biblical teachings than then I think a lot of people realize, and I, I know that for some people, these topics are scary, um, mainly because you've watched way too many movies, okay? That's really the problem, okay? Uh, I, and actually, to be honest, if I was a non-Christian, they would be scary because um, they are real, and uh, if you are not a believer, you don't have the same production uh, that a believer will, okay? So, uh, but a lot of times, even Christians are scared to talk about it, and mainly because they don't really understand what the Bible teaches. And I, I you know, I'll, I'll never forget the first time I saw a demonic deliverance. I was, um, I, I was fairly newer believer, but I was doing a lot of mission trips, and I, I made the decision to spend a summer doing evangelism in Thailand. And so I was basically leading part of this trip, and I'm, I'm, I'm very new to all this kind of stuff. In fact, actually, it was that that trip was the first time I ever really um, preached before to a crowd. And uh, so I was new to a whole lot of things in this time, and I, I, I never, I'll never forget we were having this really intense worship time. I mean, we were just, you could sense the presence of the Lord. It was like thick. It was like tangible. It was like goosebumps. And you could feel the presence of God so intensely. And all of a sudden, the girl right behind me started shrieking. And I'm like, what the heck? I actually thought she saw a cockroach because I had just killed a really giant cockroach right earlier before that. With my Bible, by the way, which turned, like I put my Bible down on it and it was like a, it was literally like a, a, a cinnamon roll. When I lifted up my Bible, it was horrible. It was just, it was awful. So I expected that, but then I, I turn around and she's shrieking and she fell to the ground and she was convulsing in a really, really weird way. Like not, not, not in a way that was like epileptic, not in a way that I'd ever seen in anywhere. It was really, really, really bizarre. And all, like the team leaders came running up to her and just literally they cast the demon out of her and then everything went back to normal. This normal, this, this normally polite girl got really strange for a second and then she got normal again. But let me tell you something, everything was the opposite of normal for me after that moment, right? I mean, when you see some of this stuff, I, I'm not gonna lie, I was kind of freaked out by it, mainly because, you know, I mean, I, I believe demons are real, I believe angels are real, but like, wow, they're real. And they want to get inside people. They want to get inside me. Like all of a sudden it was like, I better start praying more. You know what I mean? Like you, you think differently. You start, uh, like it changes things. And what I didn't understand at the time, what I didn't fully comprehend at the time is that demons, for the Christian, demons have no power except that which we give them, okay? Ultimately, the authority, it, the author, we possess the authority, okay? If there's demons with us, it's because we're cooperating. And uh, I, I just, you have the full authority to resist them, which is why James 4, 7 says, give yourself humbly to the Lord, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Okay, you have the authority, but, you know, to live free of their influence, but 
I, so, but really, if I could say it this way, their only real power for, for the believer is they can lie to you. They can whisper. They can whisper lies into your ear, whisper doubts into your dreams. They do have that ability. And of course, that's why we have to take those thoughts captive and make them obedient to Christ, okay? But I, I just, and sometimes we actually believe those lies. God doesn't care. Or you're too far gone. You've done too much for God. It, it's too late. Okay, whatever the whisper is, I don't know why I was doing this when the, it was just like I'm talking on the phone with, with the devil, but I, 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 however the devil whispers to you, I think a lot of times we get into agreement with those emotions and then when we do that, we open the door and the window for the demonic. And so I'm saying this because over the next three first Wednesdays, obviously today, uh, but first Wednesday, October, first Wednesday, November, um, we're gonna have some fun because I'm gonna talk about demonology and I really want you guys to be confident about this. I want you guys to be able to walk in authority and I want you to be able to kick the devil's butt because he's robbing so many people. They're robbing so many people. And I, I'm telling you, I, I think by the end of this series, so it's kind of a first Wednesday series, I'll be doing the next several first Wednesdays, but I, I think you're gonna have a much different perspective on spiritual warfare. And, and, uh, and, and again, I'm, I'm gonna have like a blog on this, okay? So as this thing progresses, I'm gonna continue to list books and additional stuff. Uh, basically a book's worth of material at peterhaas.org forward slash demonology, demonology. Okay, which is the technical term for angelology, demonology. Uh, it's a theological term, okay, I didn't make it up. All right, so um, just to give you a little context though, I wanna start by, by really unpacking this in Matthew 4 because you know, Jesus in this, in this particular passage, he's just picking the first disciples and of course Matthew is trying to describe who Jesus was, what, he, what, what, what made him unique amidst all the other rabbis. And it says this, Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon possessed, those having seizures and the paralyzed, and he what? Healed them, okay. So, and then it's, it goes on. Large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. Okay, so uh, just allow me to point something out here that is kind of interesting, and I, I, I just, uh, Jesus was not known for his poetic wisdom, okay? Now, I suppose he was poetic, and he, of course, was wise, but that's not exactly what Matthew pointed out there, was it, okay? He, Jesus was not known for being a philosopher. Contrary to popular thought, he was not known for theological truth. Yes, he was a teacher, but once again, look at verse 24, okay? I, I think this is interesting. News about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon possessed. Okay, this is what he's known for. If you're good at something, guess what? You get more clients, okay? And this is, Jesus was known for being a miracle worker and an exorcist, so to speak, okay? If he was known for his philosophy, people would have invited their philosopher friends. Does that make sense? Okay, instead people thought, they, they, I'm bringing my sick person, I'm bringing my dying friend, I'm bringing that really, really weird boss of mine that is demon possessed, okay? Now I say this because there are, there are literally thousands of books written about the methods of Jesus, yet it's amazing how few of them um, will, will reference demonology. They'll ignore the fact that casting out demons was one of the central ministries of Christ. This was not like an add-on to his, his ministry or a little side subculture of his ministry. In many ways, it was front and center all throughout the Gospels, and it remained front and center throughout the book of Acts, okay? And in fact, just jump ahead to four chapters to Matthew chapter 18. Here's another little 
passage for you. When evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to him, and he drove out the spirits with a word and healed all the sick. What made it unique is that he drove them out with a word. In those days, most exorcists, most rabbis who would cast out demons would have, they had all sorts of little tools. They, they were almost like herbalists. They had like rings, they had amulets, they had, you know, uh, bowls of water. They have all these like lucky charms to kind of make it happen. And Jesus didn't use any of those things. Most of the time they would cast out demons in the name of Solomon. And I'm not gonna get into why they did that. I'll explain that a little bit more uh, in the future because they, but, but this is what made him unique is that he would do it, but all he would do is just one word, leave, be gone. You know what I'm saying? And it was just, it was unique. It was like, and he healed all of the sick, okay? So again, Jesus was not merely some theologian. People were not saying, hey, you know what? Let's go hear Jesus expound the book of Leviticus, man. I hear he's got a pretty hot hermeneutic. Oh, he's like, a, he's like a YouTuber, you know? He's like a, oh, he's got some really cool life hacks, you know? And uh, no, he's, he, he's driving out demons. This is kind of a freak fest, okay? What he was doing was a little strange. If you were to analyze this from a church growth method, I mean, it'd basically be like, hey, everybody, let's bring all of the scary people to Peter's mom's house tonight. Okay, if you got something funky going on in Capernaum, there's a place for you. Now, I guarantee you Peter's mom was a little ticked, okay? Like, why are we having all these scary people come to my house? You know what I'm saying? Like, can we like rent a neutral location, okay? I, that's what I would be thinking. I mean, because I'm sure strange people were knocking on her door for weeks. Like, is Jesus home? You know, like, I guarantee you, like, she's like, no, he left a long time ago, please. You know what I'm saying? Like, never again. Um, but, but why, okay, if, if it's so central to Jesus, why, why don't churches talk about it? Well, I mean, because especially when non-Christians eat this stuff up. And how do I know? Because there's a never-ending supply of movies on deliverance. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I'm just saying, people can't get enough of this stuff in the world. Why aren't churches talking about it? Well, I think one of the reasons is, is that most Christians don't even have a basic knowledge of it. They don't even have a basic knowledge of who is Satan. They wouldn't know if he's a cherubim, seraphim, Elohim, Ophanim. They wouldn't even know what spiritual being he is because we don't even know the basics about it a lot of times. And so, uh, and, and I, you know, a lot of pastors that I talk to don't even know a lot about it. They believe in it, but again, it's one of those things we believe in, but we just, ah, it's a little scary and let's just kind of, you know, as long as it doesn't happen on Sundays, we're good, right? But I, I just, you know, I, I, I want to I wanna help you just explore some of these things. And so I'm going to give you a little sneak peek into the flow chart, so to speak. And, and you guys have read the scripture many times, but I just want to point it out once more time. E Ephesians 6, Paul says, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. And then he kind of unpacks it for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against, you know, it's not against humans. There's a spiritual element here. It's against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in where? The heavenly realms. So if you really want to know what our enemy is, no, it's not your coworker or your boss, and it's not the weird, you know, the, the strange person who's into witchcraft down the street. That's not our enemy. In fact, actually, they're a victim. We're here to rescue all of these people. We're here to rescue people that think politically and overly politically. We're here to rescue people that think this or that philosophically. And we're here to, not, not to our political view, but to the kingdom. Does that make sense? Okay, so, uh, and unfortunately, a lot of Christians don't even realize that. They literally have picked up a different gospel than the kingdom. Okay, and they, they've also demonized the wrong enemy. They think it's a human when it's, when it's a, a spiritual forces of evil. So it begs the question, well, Paul, what, who, like, who are the principalities and powers, the authorities, the power? You know, like, what, what, what do those words mean? Like, how does Satan actually structure things? Well, I mean, there, Paul makes it very clear there's a hierarchy of sorts, right? I mean, but what does that mean? Well, to accomplish the understanding of that hierarchy, we first have to understand what is God's hierarchy? Because you have, to, you have to understand, Satan doesn't want to have a counterfeit of something that isn't real. 
And so there's a real hierarchy that God set up in heaven, and we got to understand that first. And so we got to go into a little more angelology, so to speak, for a second. Um, and, and I know the term angel, what's really complicated about it is like when you, so uh, back in, back, I went to U of M for Hebrew, it was really functional, and, and uh, somehow it turned out good for me. But I, I uh, when, I was, when I was there, I learned a lot of the Hebrew words and I also learned a lot of Greek, Koine Greek. And what's interesting is the, the, the Greek word for angel is, when, when you see angel in the New Testament, which was written in Greek, it's not the same as angel in the Old Testament. When you read Satan in the New Testament, it's not the same definition, the Hebraic Semitic definition of Satan in the Old Testament. And the same thing is true with a lot of different words. And I'm gonna unpack some of those uh, in the coming weeks. But, but uh, again, there's, there's all sorts of, the word angel, angelos in Greek is kind of a catch-all for all spiritual beings in the New Testament. But in the Old Testament, um, the, it's broken down way, 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 way more. And I just want to introduce you to a few of the Hebrew terms um, that are in the Old Testament that you're going to see ref, uh, used as references to spiritual beings, okay? So there's this word Elohim. Now, Elohim with a capital E, um, uh, Elo, uh, Elohim Olam, that means the, the, the God, okay? It's a reference to God Almighty. Well, his actual name is Yahweh, okay? But if you were to refer to generic spiritual beings, gods, you would refer to Elohim, okay, lowercase e. In fact, there's another group in the, in the Old Testament that are called ben a Elo, Ben is son, okay, sons of God, okay, ben a Elohim exists. That, that there are ben Elohim in the kingdom of heaven, okay? So it's really important you know that there are sons of God in the Old Testament in heaven and currently in heaven, okay? So Elohim is a generic word, that can refer to God, but also can refer to a, a, any spiritual being that inhabits the heavenly realms, okay? So then you have Malachim. This is the more traditional Hebrew word for angels or messengers. Then you have cherubim, you have seraphim. These were throne room guardians, okay? Uh, a lot of people argue that seraphim were dragon-like cherubim. You've seen, you know, multiple faces, okay? Then you have uh, the, the, the word for spirit in Hebrew is ruach, okay? And you can say it like you're really trying to clear your throat. Um, and then the plural is ruachot, okay? That's the feminine. If you're wondering where all these eems come from, eem is basically, or ot is basically uh, the equivalent of s. It just means multiple, okay? So malak or malakim, one angel, many angels, okay? Cherub, cherubim, okay? Ruach, ruachot, and then giburim, these are what we would call maybe mighty angels or angelic warriors, angels that do battle, okay? So now there's, there's actually a lot more. There's Ophanim, there's Shadim, territorial spirits, there's Sarim, uh, principalities, literally leaders of uh, other spiritual beings, okay? And I'm not gonna get too deep into this and, and lose all of you because here's the truth, okay? The, the, if, you, if I was to kind of summarize what scholars say about all these different words, we don't know uh, which of these is a species, which of these is a job description, or which of these simply refers to a hierarchy, okay? So for example, if we can say seraphim, are they, they're like dragon-like throne guardians. Well, you know, is that what they actually are? Is it a species? Or does the one example where we see some seraphim flying around, they just happen to look like that, and that God happened to have that particular animal serving in that particular role, is it a role? We don't know. Is it a job description? Like, because, you know, unfortunately, like Malachim in the Old Testament, angels, I could even, Malachim can even be a human on earth, okay? So it's a messenger. So it, it refers to a lot more. And so th that's where a lot of the debate comes from. Now, I actually do have an opinion as to how that flows, but I, I just, I wanted you to understand where, where the murkiness is, and I don't wanna make gray areas of scripture more black and white than they are. Does that make sense? Okay, so now, um, now here's what we know for sure, okay? So in the Old Testament, God makes it clear that he has a decision-making council of Beni Elohim that make decisions with him. And what do I mean like that, okay? So uh, God presides in the great assembly, okay? The psalmist, right, Asaph wrote, right? He presides in the great assembly, and he's talking about in heaven right now, there's a great assembly, okay? And it says God renders judgment among the gods. The word there is Elohim, lowercase 
E, okay? And, and then later on, it refers to that, if you keep reading the psalm, it starts referring to them as the Beni Elohim, the sons of God, and it refers to them in a good way, okay? So it's not talking about false gods on the earth. It's talking about the, the, the leadership assembly, almost like the Congress, the Senate, if you will, of heaven that God presides in, okay? And, and so there's this, there's an assembly. And if you're wondering, well, how does that assembly work? How does it look? Well, we actually see it in multiple different places. For example, in 1 Kings 22, um, it's kind of an interesting passage. We, we can kind of see how the Lord interacts with this council, okay? Because God basically says, you know, in this particular context, he's asking the council, hey, how are we going to take out this wicked king Ahab? I want you guys to brainstorm, okay? So, and, and not because he has to, but because he's chosen to, the same way that God chooses to work with us in the purpose of evangelism and discipleship, he chooses to work with the Beni Elohim, the sons of God in the assembly. And so he's like, how are we going to take out this wicked king Ahab? And that's where I read in verse 21, 1 Kings 22, 21, one suggested this and another suggested that. I'm so curious, like what they were doing. Like, I want him to walk into a rake and then fall into a pit. And then the other one, no, nah, that's not a good one. And then the next one is like, I got another. And then, and then everybody's like, yeah, that's too extreme, okay? And then finally, a spirit came forward, stood before the Lord and said, I will entice him. By what means, right? The Lord asked. I will go out and be a deceiving spirit in the mouths of all of his prophets, his false prophets, okay? Keep in mind, Ahab was a wicked king, had multiple chances to, to, to turn his character around, and God knew he's not, and so we have to decide what, how we're going to save our people, particularly, you know, the prophets, okay? The, the godly prophets, okay? So now God made a decision along with his counsel, and it was carried forth. Does he have to do it that way? No, but he chooses to. Okay, and so what happens is when the when the council, the sons of God, the Beni Elohim, make a decision along with God, what happens? Well, then the Ruachot, the spirits, and the Malachim, the angels, go and they carry it out. They make it happen on the earth, okay? So now, but here's what makes the Beni Elohim really unique, okay? They are unique in the sense, and here's what makes them different than the other spirits, okay? They are different in that they carry God's image, okay? Of all the species that God created in the heaven, heavens, cherubim, seraphim, all the other things, okay? There are two that carry his image and in his likeness, okay? The first is the Beni Elohim, the sons of God, Elohim, they're like him, okay? And can you guess who the other is? You and I, humans, carry the image and the likeness of God. So when God said, let us make man in our image, he was actually speaking to the divine council, the Elohim. He's not going to say, somebody, I remember reading a scholar that said he said that to the Trinity. Uh, he doesn't have to say that to the Trinity because they already knew, you know, like I... Like, it's like, I don't get it. He was actually, but, but he was speaking to the assembly, let us make man in our image. Does that make sense, everybody? Okay, so he's, he's again, they're deciding and then it's carried out. Okay, so, so it begs the question, well then, what, like, um, what's the difference then between humans and Beni Elohim, right? Well, we are in some ways the earthly physical version of them. When God was creating a new capital on earth known as the Garden of Eden, he was creating, you know, he was doing a lot more than that. He was creating millions and millions and millions of planets and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of animals. So, you know, he needed someone to make some decisions. What is this? It's a giraffe. What is that? It's a mule. This is a monkey or whatever. I, you know, I, th he was busy, right? Or what are we going to call this? Let's call it a, a fern. You know, like, I, it makes me wonder if, like, Adam was like, no, let me change my mind. You know, like, I, I don't know. But clearly God was creating things and he needed a, a, another group of people, humans, to rule and subdue everything he creates. Why? Because it's who God is, he's gonna keep doing it. And if you think he's gonna stop with earth, he's not gonna stop with earth. There's millions of galaxies out there. He's just getting started, right? We're just doing this little blip of a thing called sin that we're gonna deal with. And then we're gonna go and have some fun. It's gonna be like Star Trek and Minecraft all over the universe. <laughs> and so it's gonna be, it's gonna be awesome, right? But I, I just, so, but, so essentially, we are the earthly physical versions of the Elohim. God was creating a new capital, 
And so he needed to add another counsel to the Beni Elohim that looks just like them and like him, except the difference is, okay, and I know this is kind of obvious, but what's the difference between us and the Elohim? We procreate. Our command was to be fruitful and multiply, and in doing so, we spread Eden and we rule and subdue all the things that God creates, okay? So now, are you saying, Pastor Peter, that the Beni Elohim can't procreate, like they don't have the capability of doing it? No, they, uh, it's not so much that. Uh, some argue that, uh, that the Beni Elohim actually have the abilities, meaning the, the faculties, with that, I'm trying to be nondescriptive, uh, <laughs> but God commanded them to not do that for one reason or another, okay? Now, and, and I'm not even gonna get into that uh, and, and, and try to explain why. And perhaps it had something to do with their special powers, something, limitations that God wanted for them. But if I was to summarize it like this, you and I humans look like Elohim, we rule like Elohim, but when all the other creatures look at us, guess what? When they see us and the Elohim, they see God's image and they defer to our leadership, okay? So we were created for spiritual leadership in the world, which is why ever since sin entered the world, what is corrupted in mankind is power. We are power hungry. We have problems with power and we talk about it every night on the nightly news, okay? Does this make sense so far? Okay, now, so it begs the question, well then, so was the devil an Elohim? Probably not, okay? Most scholars argue that the devil was either a seraphim or a cherubim. Uh, in other words, he, he was some sort of throne room guardian, okay? So uh, seraphs looked like serpents with feet, okay? Which would make sense, you know, for Satan, you know, because the Bible talks about him as a serpent, okay? The, the Hebrew word for serpent also means oracle teller. So it was meant to be like a double entendre when it was used in the Old Testament, okay? It meant to have two meanings, but uh, seraphim looked like serpents. And so, you know, that, that makes logical sense why it would be a serpent in the garden, but uh, also uh, some people presume that seraphs are fiery, like they look like they're on fire because the Hebrew word serap means on fire, right, to burn. And so, you know, they're like these fiery looking serpents, hence the, all the descriptors of Satan as being a dragon, okay, throughout history. You, you can kind of see where that comes from. Now, other scholars argue that Satan was a cherubim, which is actually, I, I tend to fall a little bit more on these sides. And to be honest, I don't know, you can't know these things for sure. Maybe there's a few people out there that do, I don't. But I, I think, I'm, I'm trying to give you where scholars dis disagree on some of this stuff so that you can hold it with humility, okay? So uh, people argue that Satan was a cherubim. I, now, keep in mind, I, I just wanna say this real fast. Cherubim and seraphim have wings, Elohim do not, okay? Angels, actually, if you really are really careful about studying angels, angels are never described as having animal-like features in scripture, okay? If you actually look for the word malek or and, like angelos and you look, it's never actually in coordination with any animal-like characteristics like wings, okay? So like when, when the, and I'm not saying that, hey, you know, there aren't species with wings, because again, cherubim and seraphim have wings, right? But I mean, we, we just kind of call everything an angel, okay? But I, I want, I'm just trying to ground you in the scriptures here, like, because again, angels, an, angels don't have like multiple faces and, and wings, and they do clearly have the ability, according to scripture, to like shape shift somehow. I don't know how they're able to, you know, turn off their um, angelic glorious uh, uh, appearance, but another term that we use for Elohim or Beni Elohim are the morning stars, okay, or cocoa beam in Hebrew, okay, so you've, you've heard the term morning star. Well, it's a, like, or holy ones, glorious ones in scripture, okay? Now, why is all of this important, okay? Now, here's why. Have you ever wondered why in the world was the serpent in the Garden of Eden in the first place? Why? why? God, why would you put this husband-wife combo in the middle of a garden with a real deceiving, smart, oracle-giving, serpent-like thing. Why would you do that? I, I just, why would you put a devious creature, you know, like that in a sacred space, okay? And, and for, for starters, what a lot of people miss about the Garden of Eden, again, it wasn't just a, a, a petting zoo with two humans and a bunch of animals, okay? I, I just, 
You know, I, I know that these work, maybe we get these images because, you know, we're trying to communicate to our kids what the Garden of Eden looked like, right? And so it looks like a jungle with random animals in it. But uh, you have to understand, Ezekiel 28 actually refers to Eden as the, the Garden of God was actually a council chamber. It was like a capital, okay? So it wasn't just Adam and Eve in this garden. There were a lot of people in the Garden of Eden. In fact, uh, Ezekiel 28 actually refers to the Garden of Eden as a council chamber on a mountain that had four rivers flowing through it. Yes, it was a very lush garden, but it was also a mountain. It was a council chamber. God wanted to spread. He wanted the Garden of Eden ultimately to spread all over across the earth. Hypothetically, earth would have been like the ruling capital from which all the, you know, everything else goes out from here. But the end goal was actually a ruling council. And you can kind of just, if you just fast forward to the end of your Bibles, right, Revelation 21, we see the new Jerusalem come down onto earth, okay? So you can kind of see where this is actually meant to go, where the Garden of Eden was intended to go, and this is this rule, uh, it, was, it was the throne room. It was meant to be a throne room that was being built, okay? So uh, a lot of people, if, if, if according to Ezekiel 28, it actually refers to what we believe is Satan as a cherubim in the Garden of God, okay? So if you, it, Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14, there are these kind of really interesting uh, passages that are worth studying, but the implication is that, according to Ezekiel 28, is that Satan was a cherubim, he was a throne room guardian who was in the Garden of Eden on purpose by God, okay? But wait, Pastor Peter, wait, didn't, didn't Satan fall before Adam and Eve? Isn't that what we were taught? Well, not necessarily, okay? Whenever anybody tells me that, I'm always like, okay, if you search the Bible for where that scripture is, you're not gonna find a single scripture that says Satan fell before Adam and Eve, okay? And here's why, okay? In theology, it's called the gap theory. Now, it's important that you understand that the gap theory didn't even exist. This idea of Satan falling before the earth, before Adam and Eve, it didn't even exist until the 1700s, okay? In fact, actually, it was popularized in the early 1800s. Uh, there was a, 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 I think he was a Scottish theologian, Thomas Chalmers, uh, who started advocating for what's called the gap theory. Um, he wanted to understand why would Satan be in the garden and so what he, what he did is he postulated, well, this is where the gap theory comes from. Let me just quickly show you, okay? Genesis 1.1, in the very beginning, the first, book of, or first verse of the Bible, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Okay, now uh, Thomas Chalmers actually, he thought, well, there's got to be a time when Satan fell. So I'm just going to arbitrate. He made the decision that in between verse one and verse two is when it happened. Okay, there was a gap somewhere in v between verse one and verse two. And in that gap, Satan rebelled. And that's where he, you know, took out the angels. And that's where um, all these things happened that were terrible. And so God threw Satan to the earth. And that's why he was in the garden. And okay, let me just give you what the, another interpretation that was actually the one that was more common all the way up through the 1700s, up until then, instead of the gap theory. A lot of scholars believe that Satan, also known as the serpent, uh, actually fell alongside Adam and Eve. In other words, when Adam and Eve had the fall in Genesis 3, Satan had the fall at the exact same moment as they did. In other words, if, if, it's, if we are to uh, take Ezekiel 28 as it implies that Satan was a cherubim in the garden of God, he was actually, it actually describes him as carrying the high priest ephod, the, the stones, all of the sacred stones. In other words, Satan was actually the high priest of the Garden of Eden. And he was the one who led worship on behalf of everything up until that time, okay? So it's, in other words, he was supposed to give Adam and Eve really good information about God. He was the, 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 the Nakash, the, the serpent that gave oracles, that would give insights. In fact, if he was a seraphim, remember the seraphim in Isaiah 6, they just circle God's throne and they say, holy, holy, holy. What they're doing is they're, they're, they're flying around God learning new things about him. And so seraphim were known as having like secret knowledge and insight about God. 
God because they were, they were closer to him than most. And so they would have all these insights. Same thing with cherubim. And so, you know, if Satan was a cherubim, a high priest, he was supposed to be giving correct information about God and yet something got evil in him. And, and, and so this is what, if, if Ezekiel 28 is referring to, referring to Satan, it says, you were anointed as a guardian cherub for so I ordained you. You were on the holy mount of God which is again, Eden, you walked among the fiery stones. The fiery stones are associated with God's throne council. We don't know what they are, but we know that they were in his council chamber, right? You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till wickedness was found in you. And when was that wickedness found? Well, when he said, did God really say to Adam and Eve? And then, because, and, and think about it, okay? I'm just, I'm, I'm not saying this is like fact and you all have to agree with me, but uh, you know, again, the devil was a guardian cherub, a high priest up until all three of them fell. And, and, and if you think about it, in Genesis 3, when he gives the curse, he spanks all three of them all at the same time, doesn't he? You know, he's like, oh, you, man, woman, then serpent, you're gonna crawl on the ground, right? So, and so he, all of that happened in that moment, okay? And then he kicks them out of the, guard, uh, of the, of the garden and he puts a cherub to guard it. Again, you get to see what cherubs do and they guard, okay? So it begs the question, well then, if, if, if the serpent, Satan, was the first to fall, then where did all the other evil principalities come from? And when did that happen? right? Good questions. You guys are good question askers. I'm just saying, it's good, you know, where do they come from? Where do demons come from? Where did, where did Satan get all of his minions? Okay, so let, let's, let's find out by just, just reading sequentially through the book of Genesis. Okay, go back to Genesis 3, okay, because God tells the serpent in the curse. Okay, so this is in the curse when, when God is like letting the serpent know, okay, very bad, very, like you tricked Adam and Eve, but let me tell you how, how we're going to get back. I will put enmity between you and the woman, problems. You're going to have stress, problems, strife, and between your offspring and hers, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Okay, so basically, like God in that, if you, if you read it in context, he'll actually, he's saying there's going to be a savior that will be a human born of a woman who is going to stomp on your head. If you, like he basically tells the serpent how he's going to get his bell rung because of this thing he did, okay? And so it's, it's the, so the serpent, think about it from his perspective, okay? From this point onward, the devil is going to be obsessed with this prophecy, isn't he? Because he's going to be like, it's coming. It's basically just like, it's coming, Right now he's got to live like in like paranoid the rest of his existence. Like when is this coming? When will my head be crushed? Okay, I mean, who is this man born of a woman? How do I take him out? I mean, his nemesis could arrive at any given moment. And so, and it's kind of fascinating that God essentially tells the serpent how he's going to die. And you know, he basically clarifies it's not going to happen through my angels. Although I could send my army of angels and just take you out, Satan. It's not going to happen from a lightning bolt from my throne. Although I probably could throw a good lightning bolt your way, okay? Rather, it's gonna come of a, of a human man born of a woman. And of course, we know who that human man was, Jesus born of a you know, Virgin Mary, right? The prophecy is critical though, because if you think about this prophecy, it becomes a lens through which you and I are supposed to read all of the stories in Genesis from here forth. Okay, now just, just stop for a second and think about this because what comes right after the fall of mankind, they get kicked out of the garden and then we read the story of Cain and Abel. Adam and Eve had two sons and, and of course, if, if the devil saw two sons come out of Eve, guess what he's gonna think? Which of these are my enemy? Which of these are my nemesis? Which of these could be the one who could, you know, crush my head. Well, so what does he do? I got to figure out a way to take these guys out, right? And so he, he tempted Cain to kill Abel. And of course, you know, two birds with one stone. You know what I'm saying? I took out both of my adversaries, both potential enemies uh, in, one, in one fell swoop in Genesis 4. But then of course, so you just keep walking it through, right? The devil was like, well, what else can I do? 
uh, to stop this prophecy from happening. And, and, you know, of course, as they started cranking out babies, he's starting to think, this is really hard. I mean, I can't just, you know, I mean, it's kind of hard to tempt someone to kill someone, right? I mean, I, you can do it with a lot of people, but, you know, not everybody's going to be, uh, sure, you know, like, so how do I get... How do I get, like, I, 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 he, you know, the devil is trying to think of how do I stop this prophecy from continuing to spin out? And of course, you know, and he, he tried, he tried a lot. In fact, every single time he knew something big was going to happen, of course, what did he do? He tried to like, well, think about it. Like, remember when Moses was born, the devil tempted Pharaoh to try to take out an entire generation of kids, right? They started, you know, putting them all out onto the Nile to be eaten by crocodiles, right? And of course, you know, Moses got rescued, okay? You see, want to know why? Because the devil thought Moses might be that one, Okay, same thing happened with the Christmas story. Remember when the devil, you know, uh, tempted King Herod to kill all the babies? You know what I'm saying? Like you can kind of see on the big moments and the big events when, when there's all these additional prophecies, all of a sudden the, the serpent got nervous and he's like, I got to make sure, I got to take out my adversary somehow. I got to make sure, right? And so like go back to Cain and Abel for a second. Okay, it, Satan's next thought was, well, okay, if I can't, you know, I, I can't, it's not realistic to just tempt everyone to kill other, everybody else. But what I could do is what if, what if, what if I could do this? What if, if I know the prophecy has to be a human, what if I could mess with that bloodline? What if I could somehow skew the bloodline of humanity? What if, what if I could tempt some Elohim who look just like humans to join my quest? You know what I'm saying? Like, what, what if I could tempt some of these Elohim to abandon their first estate, as Jude 1.6 puts it, and, and, and where they leave their, their heavenly home to actually mate with humans and screw up the bloodline? What if I could, you know, thwart this prophecy by wrecking the genetic line and then watch what happens? Genesis chapter 6, okay? When human beings began to increase in number on the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God... Beni Elohim saw that the daughters of humans were beautiful and they married any of them they chose mating with them. Okay, so now just, I want you just to absorb this statement for a second because Elohim is exclusively, it, 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 there's nowhere it was ever used to refer to a human being. This is divine beings, okay? Beni Elohim saw that the daughters of humans were beautiful and they married them, okay? So now, the, uh, like this expression, Elohim, was used for divine beings, okay? And anybody, I, like there's a huge amount of scholarly research proving this, okay? In the ancient Semitic world, the divine beings who ruled over angels were Elohim, okay? So now, and, and if I could just, let me rewind a little bit, okay? Just to recap this. In the book of Job, which some people believe is one of the oldest books in the Bible, it, it says this, it, it's, it's God is rebuking Job for having so many opinions, okay? And he says this in Job 38, four, it says, where were you when I laid the earth's foundations? Okay, so this is God talking. Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know, like he's almost like being sarcastic. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set or, or who laid its cornerstone while the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God, the Beni Elohim, shouted for joy? In other words, where were you? When, he's basically describing creation and what, what was happening. The, the sons of God, the Beni Elohim, were there at creation. Why? Because let us make man in our image, right? So they were there and they were like, yeah, let's do it. And they'll sing a song. You know, like, okay, so you can get the idea, okay? Okay, so the morning stars, Beni Elohim, a lot of times they, 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 scholars will use those two terms interchangeably, okay? So basically the Beni Elohim, these were from the beginning of the earth, okay, a reference to the divine council who were there at the, the creation of the world. So these are not humans. That's my point, is they're not humans. The term Elohim is heavenly places, right? So let's go right back to uh, Genesis 6-1, okay? Um, so when human beings began to increase in number on the earth and the daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of humans were beautiful and they married any of them they chose mating with them, okay? Then, then let's skip down to verse four. This is kind of an interesting verse. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days. And so all of a sudden you have this appearance of this, this another group. So the Nephil, Eam is like more than one, right? The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and so afterwards when the sons of God went 
to the daughters of humans and had children by them. So in other words, where did they come from? From this, this mating, okay, this interesting mating. They were, they were, the Nephilim, the heroes of old. These heroes that you've always heard about in, myth, in mythology, they were the heroes of old, men of renown. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. In other words, okay, so now the, the word Nephilim, just so that you know, it actually comes from the Aramaic word for giant, okay? So giants like Goliath, like super tall, okay? So that's why the Septuagint, when it was translated from Hebrew into, the, into its language, they always translated it as giants, and actually it remained that. The, this, this, the, the word Nephilim was actually translated in all of the, like if you have the old King James Bible or the new King James, they'll actually just put in giant instead of Nephilim uh, because that's what it meant, right? And then eventually they were like, let's just, you know, giants, I mean, let's, you know, let's just put Nephilim back in there, okay? So it's almost like uh, translators wanted to, uh, I hate to use the word obfuscate, but make it harder to understand what the word meant, okay? So essentially the Bible teaches that there was a half breed, half human, half Elohim, and they were huge, okay? And now as strange as what I'm describing to you sounds, this is what the average Jewish person believed when Christ walked the earth. This was commonly held, if you read any of the apocryphal books, Jews regularly, this is what they thought, okay? And in fact, actually, this is what the early church fathers, the disciples of the disciples actually taught as well. They believed the Nephilim were a half-breed of, of, of heavenly Elohim and humans, okay? And, and naturally, I, I can say this, over, if you study theology over the last 150 years or so, I think a lot of modern scholars were like, ah, man, I don't know. I mean, really, the idea of there being a race of giants on the earth sounds kind of fairy tale ish Maybe we can, like, help God out by changing things a little, you know? <laughs> I mean, this expression, the sons of God, I mean, I, like, why don't we just change it to, like, the sons of Israel? One translation actually has the sons of Israel. Or they, let's just say angels. And they, they started using these different words because they were thinking, well, we don't want people to think that, you know, we believe in, um, you know, polytheism. We don't want people to believe that, you know. And so the only problem is, is that it, 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 it obscures what the Bible actually teaches, which will all of a sudden become very, very consequential when it comes to understanding principalities and powers, how the flow chart actually works, because every one of these different species is motivated slightly different, okay? So, and, and there's this, but it suffices to say that Jewish people were obsessed with this, this idea of the race of giants. In fact, even the, the Jewish historian Josephus, who was born right after the time of Christ, he would even say, along with several early church fathers, like, hey, we all know there were giants, right? Because there's museums with Nephilim bones in them, right? Which uh, we don't have those bones today, and we're not able to verify that. And so if you're wondering, do we still have Nephilim bones somewhere? No, we, you know, like some people say we do, but uh, you know, like here's the deal. Okay. Um, uh, like I, whether or not we have authenticated Nephilim bones, I, I do believe from a science perspective that it is totally plausible that giants walk the earth. I mean, come on. If you've ever been to a museum, there were, you know, fossils for giant rats and giant dragonflies and giant turtles. There were crocodiles that we found that are the size of 18 wheelers. We got like, you know, what's the, you know, shark, the megalodon, you know what I'm saying? And we have giant everything else. Why, why is it so like hard to imagine that there might be really big humans? You know what I'm saying, right? I, I just, I, I say that because if you're interested, I actually did an entire message on that in October uh, 2019, I did an entire message on what was the actual size of Goliath and all the different theories, the scientific fe feasibility of giant humans. But I, I, I just wanna quickly reference that because that same, that same month, October 2019, I also did an entire message on Og of Bashan, who was a Nephilim giant that the Bible says that he had two beds end to end because um, he was like, you know, like 13 feet because um, he was that big. And so I, I, regardless of whether or not you believe in, you know, half Elohim demigods, the fact remains, okay, this was the standard belief of Jews up until, you know, the, the time of Christ, okay? So now even modern scholars, this is kind of interesting, modern scholars actually believe that all of Greek mythology came from the Nephilim. 
And there's a lot of evidence to suggest that that's actually true. Like, for example, think about it. Like Hercules or, or Perseus, all these things, both were offsprings of a god who came and took a human wife. And, and then we talk about the war of the giants, the clash of the titans. Okay, all these things do have their root in scripture going up into the days of Noah. And that's why, that's actually why it says that. They were the heroes of old. Now, I'm not suggesting that Hercules literally lived, but we're saying that these myths that the Greeks and the Romans came up with were actually based on this. In fact, actually, we know for a fact that Roman mythology about Vulcan and Venus actually were based on Tubal-Cain and Naamah mentioned in Genesis 4, 22. So, I mean, like, again, there's, there's a foundation here. Okay, now, m- now let me just... Without getting too lost in the details, I get too excited about this. Okay, so sorry about this. I can hear my wife in you know, my head saying, Peter, move along, move along. Okay, so, um, Genesis, so here's, the, here's the big picture, okay? Genesis 6 implies Satan tempted Elohim to defy God with him by satisfying their lusts. And the plan was simple. If there are no pure humans left on the earth, there cannot be any Messiah. Does that make sense? If everybody is a half-breed, they're no longer pure humans. They're not pure. In fact, when the Bible refers to Noah as being pure, it, he wasn't pure from a moral standpoint because we all saw he drank a little too much liquor, but he, you know, he, he was pure from a, a genetic humanity standpoint, right? Okay, he was a pure human, which is why the genealogies are so important. Have you ever wondered why the Bible goes into all those genealogies? Why? Because it's the purity of the fulfillment of the prophecy of a, a human man born of a woman. It's very, very critical to very verify that kind of stuff. It's also why God was so into blood and clean animals versus unclean animals. You have to understand, this is all about protecting the genetic bloodline related to the prophecies. Does that make sense, everybody? And so, like, okay, so, so, so Satan is thinking, if I can permanently wreck bu- human bloodlines, maybe I can mess with God's plan or at least delay it. And guess what? That's why God sent the flood because he was actually rectifying the human bloodline. He's like, yep, it is getting a little chaotic. Let's, you know, thin out the, the, the wrong stuff, the unclean, okay, for the clean. And here's the big aha moment, okay? This is what I was actually building to the entire message, okay? Everything I just shared is why during the times of Christ, the average Jew believed that demons were actually the departed spirits of the Nephilim who died before the flood, who died during the flood. Does that make sense? In other words, they were these half Elohim human mixes that God took out and those things became spirits, disembodied spirits. In other words, the reason why demons are obsessed with human bodies is because guess what? At one point they had them and they no longer have them. The reason why they're called unclean spirits is because they're not fully human, okay? Does that make sense, okay? You can suddenly even see the whole filter of clean and unclean and blood. The first thing that he tells Noah after Noah gets out of the ark is don't drink blood, which kind of seems like a really strange um, uh, thing, but you can understand, God was really obsessed with keep this pure. Let's keep it right, people, you know what I'm saying? Okay, now I realized that I didn't get very practical in all of this, okay? I didn't even tell you how to cast out the demons yet, right? But I, I, I still felt it was critical because once you understand this framework, you're gonna see all sorts of things in the Bible that you never saw before. And it's gonna fundamentally change the way you pray. Because here's the thing, when people even talk about spiritual warfare, actually, there's a lot of passages in the Bible where we should not be bossing angels around, let me tell you. Okay, and I'm even talking about demonic principalities. You shouldn't be bossing them around. The Bible says that we cast out demons and then we do spiritual warfare through evangelism. And I know that sounds kind of deep, but if you understand how these categories work, there's a different tactic we use to liberate people in theologically. And it's also gonna change the way you see the end of the world because actually in the book of Revelation, it even implies that you and I who have experienced sin and get a resurrection body, guess what we're actually gonna become? Elohim. And guess what? There's gonna be physical people who are gonna live through the millennium who will still have the old school physical body and that will actually be humans like we were intended to be all along. And I know that sounds really deep, but if you really, uh, and I'm gonna unpack a lot of this, but 
Uh, uh, let me just end with this, okay? Many of you guys know I've got kind of a large library of books. I love, I love reading. I've got dozens on demonology. And again, I, I, on my blog, I, I referred to a few of my faves. Uh, if you're interested in diving 10 times deeper into all this, uh, just, just go peterhaas.org forward slash demonology, okay? But let me, let me end with this. Recently, I, I read a really practical book by Alexander Pagani called The Secrets to Deliverance. And uh, he's a pastor who's done over 400 demonic deliverances. And in his book... Uh, he tells the story of how he got interested in it. He was in a staff meeting where he was making a decision with his pastoral staff when all of a sudden his staff member said something that just triggered him and he just got angry, you know, like, again, like, and, and it turned into a fight in this, like, pastoral staff meeting and, and, and uh, just, he didn't even understand why the, the staff member made him so angry and it just triggered him and so they started fighting and I don't know if you've ever been in a fight like that. I'm sure you guys are all blissfully happy all the time and you never fight with your spouses and you never fight with your kids, right? But, but he found himself in this situation where like, why am I so overreacting? He was just angry at this staff member. And, and well, guess what? Uh, the, 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 he actually took his glasses off and he said, man, I don't know why this triggers me so much. I really need to deal with this. And then all of a sudden, that's the last thing he remembered because he like woke up on the carpet of their conference room shrieking. And he's like, what am I doing? And then all of a sudden he realized what was happening. Like, oh no, I'm going through a deliverance <laughs> in front of my own staff. His entire pastoral staff was gathered around him, casting this demon out of him. And of course, you know, his next thought was, was heck no. Like, this can't be happening to me. I'm a lead pastor, right? This is embarrassing. I can't have a demon, and yet he couldn't get off the floor. He just, it felt like somebody was standing on him. And, and suddenly, all of a sudden, he heard this peaceful voice say, I'm holding you down so that they can get this out of you. And he realized that voice was the voice of some sort of angel reassuring him that it was soon going to come to the end. And the next thing he remembers, he shrieked for 30 seconds straight, and then boom, he just kind of wakes up feeling sweaty on the floor. Like, what the heck was that? And of course, the whole experience messed with him because he thought, how could I, as a, a, not only a Christian, but as a pastor, have that in me, right? And, and then he realized, hey, you know what? It doesn't matter who you are or what you do. You know what? It, there are demons that we can welcome into our lives by agreeing with them at some point or another. There's, there's the demons that we purposefully welcomed in by participating in the occult. And then there's the demonic that we allowed in. We went through a trauma and we got bitter or we got angry or we got paranoid or we got, you know, we, we actually, you know, need fear to sustain us, right? So if you think about it, it's like people that are kind of addicted to the news. It's like they need to be angry and fearful in order to like charge themselves up. It's how they motivate themselves. You can see now if, you, if you're a person like that and you use fear in that sort of way, well, guess what? It's like saying, hey, I already like fear. And I, I mean, all sin and demons are a substitute for something God has. You actually, people actually rely on them. Christians can learn to rely on them because again, it's how they protect themselves by being angry by unforgiveness. I feel like I have to protect myself using unforgiveness and the demon's like, great. I can live rent free in that person, okay? So, you know, again, you go through, demons have no authority except that which we give them. They don't have the ability to possess us, okay? Unless, of course, we subconsciously agree with them and want them, need them to, right? But most of us, I think, a lot of times it can happen in traumatic events or we get a strange addiction and, 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 and so we get into agreement, right? Now, church, this is going to sound funny, but I actually believe that the greatest antidote to the demonic is small groups, and here's why, okay? It's not, uh, uh, it's not, let's teach everyone to become exorcists and then we'll just film it and make a million movies, right? But we're, the, the, the solution is actually small groups. It's live in authentic community with people who know when you're getting strange. Wow, you are addicted to fear. Wow, you are addicted to whatever, unforgiveness. Wow, you, like, we, I, I think when we're around each other, guess what? Intimacy, it holds a mirror to a lot of different things. Sometimes it's not very flattering, which is why a lot of times people run from healthy churches because it will actually eventually force a confrontation, okay? So I, I, 
Small groups, though, I think if you can create an environment where people can confess their sins, confess their fears, confess their temptations, confess their emotions, and then replace it with God's word, that is the greatest, greatest, greatest way to stay free. Because people are fascinated with exorcisms because they're dramatic. It's like the EMTs, the ambulance, the emergency room, right? But let me tell you, confessing your sin, living in the light, it is the greatest weapon you could possibly have to stay free from the power of darkness. Now... I know I'm preaching to the choir because we have a whole lot of our connect group leaders right here in the front rows, right? They're, they're here doing small groups, but I wanna encourage you. There's a whole lot more of you that should be creating small groups, should be leading this, should be facilitating this because ultimately, and I, I promise you, this is the greatest way to deliver people, to help people live free. And yeah, I'm gonna actually get into some of the real spooky exorcism stuff in coming months. We're gonna, I mean, it's really fun. I mean, if you think this is interesting, Oh, you haven't heard nothing. It's going to get real fun up in here. But we're, we're and maybe a little wild too, uh, some of them. But I, I just, here, here's how I want to end. It's this. God wants you to be vigilant. Demons are real. They are looking for places to live. There is a war against your soul. And the Bible teaches that Satan waits until an opportune time to get you. And that time might not be now. It might be when you experience a hardship or a death or a traumatic life change, okay? That's a lot of times when the devil can sneak in there. But listen, I, I just, I'm saying this because I, I actually believe there's some of you who you're here tonight and your doors and windows are wide open because you haven't dealt with that one area the Holy Spirit's been telling you to deal with like 10 years ago. And he's still saying it. Yep. Deal with that area, deal with your, your physical issues, deal with your working out, your weird relationship with food, your sexual impurity, deal with your addiction to snack cakes, you know, fill in the blank. I'm just preaching to the choir here, okay? I, I just, again, God wants us to be vigilant. And for others of us, that open window is, is due to unforgiveness. In fact, I won't even pray for someone's deliverance until they're willing to forgive everybody in their life and repent of all their issues. Why? Because Actually, I'm going to make your life worse. If I cast this out, it's going to come back with a vengeance, the Bible teaches. And we're going to talk about that. So in some ways, doing deliverances is actually dysfunctional and dangerous. If you're talking to a person who's not really a committed believer willing to live accountably in a small group. Does that make sense? So here's what we're going to do. I'm just going to have the band come on out here. And I, I, I just... There's one thing that seeing a, a demonic manifestation did for me when I was in Thailand, and that's it reminded me of just how important it is for me to deal with my sin issues. And I think there's a lot of people who were like, yeah, sin is bad, but you know, there's grace. And it's not that big of a deal. God will forgive me if I keep it up. Listen, no, you're not understanding. You are setting yourself up to be hijacked for who knows how long. And I'm not even talking about by principalities and powers. I'm talking about by your, your habits, your sin nature. And then even worse, you're, you're setting yourself up to be manipulated by the forces of evil. And all of a sudden that stronghold becomes not just a stronghold, but actually it becomes a cascading stronghold that turns into familiar spirits that goes generationally in your family. And that is sad because your decisions are in fact impacting the people around you. And that's what I don't want to have happen. And here's how we can avoid that. Just acknowledge what it is the Lord is saying. Just, just say, God, what is it that you're wanting me to adjust in my life right now? I wanna listen and I want to obey right here the first time and every time, right? Just acknowledge what the Holy Spirit is nudging you to do. What is that? For some of you, it's, it's not even a sin issue. It's not, it's not stop doing what you're doing. It's, it's start doing ministry. It might be start being a leader instead of a spectator. It might mean, hey, start living a generous lifestyle with your finances or get a budget. It might be, hey, start reaching out to that friend or that friend, or it might even be evangelism. God's speaking to you. Hey, if you would just be a little more intentional with this relative, they would all of a sudden give their life to Christ and your whole family would just come falling like dominoes. Holy Spirit, we just acknowledge that you have set us free to be messengers of freedom to everyone else in the world. And we want to acknowledge that when we are truly, truly, truly free, that the world gets free too. And, and God, I just believe that there's a lot of people in this room that are, are running with their shoelaces tied together. They've got 
demonic strongholds or just habits that they haven't dealt with. And Father, I just pray that every single person in this room would be able to run towards you with full strides, with full freedom, with full life. And God, we just, we just acknowledge here in this room that we cannot do it on our own. You are the true deliverer and you are the one who can liberate us and, and help us run into all things. And so God, speak to us. Speak to us about the friends that we're gonna confess to tonight. Speak to us about the groups that we're gonna go to in order to really walk out this freedom and get the accountability that you want for us. Because God, this year, I just know you wanna do great miracles in every person in this room, that you wanna, you, you wanna bring huge abundance to every single family in this room. And so Father, start here, start now, start with me. In Jesus' name we pray. If you agree with that prayer, say amen. Amen.